It was the 2010s. I was in university, and my urban studies professor started their urban transportation presentation. Cities in Latin America have discovered an amazing new public transportation option. It's kind of like a subway, but way better because you don't have to go underground, and buses are way cheaper than trains. It's called bus rapid transit, and it's clearly the future. BRT is frequently sold as this sort of golden goose solution, particularly in contemporary urban planning and geography circles, for solving all manner of public transportation problems. But what is BRT? And is it actually as good as those who promote it say it is? Let's talk about it. So before we dive deep into BRT, we should probably explain uh, what BRT is. So you probably already know this or picked it up in the intro, but BRT stands for Bus Rapid Transit. And fundamentally, it's about trying to create rapid transit style service, read subway style service, with buses and dedicated lanes, instead of subway trains and tunnels or viaducts. Largely, or almost entirely I would argue, to make transit less expensive to build. Now I want to be completely clear here, BRT can be an awesome service, it can be great! The most developed systems have everything from platform screen doors to level boarding and even high floor buses with flat floors, kind of like small metro trains. You'll also often see things like bypass lanes enabling express service, which you often don't get on metro systems, and even large bi-articulated buses that provide way more capacity than your traditional low floor city bus. And unlike a lot of modes, the ITDP, who is an organization that has long been promoting BRT, actually provides a standard for the mode, which sets out their own rules and standards for what should and shouldn't qualify as bus rapid transit. Things included as requirements are a minimum length of 3 kilometers, off-board fare payment, and fully dedicated lanes. There are actually a bunch of other factors also in the standard, and basically the system has to score a minimum number of points to qualify as BRT. But since it's a points-based system, different systems can be ranked against one another based on how many points they score. I'll link to the standard and the ITDP's website down below, and I think it's something that you should definitely read. It's really interesting, and there are a lot of valuable insights inside it that don't just apply to BRT. You're probably curious, since I've talked about them a lot, whether the Viva system in the Toronto region and the Ottawa Transitway in Ottawa, Canada's capital city, are on the list. And they actually are, and they both rank as BRT bronze. Always gotta love an Olympic medals comparison. But this is actually where I start to get a little skeptical of the rating and ranking and scoring system. Because in my mind, Ottawa's system, at least pre-tramification, was a lot better than the Viva system. Mostly because buses were actually regularly used on it. Okay, I'm joking. Mostly. But this did actually highlight some things to me about the standard, which also has sections that actually take away points from systems for having bad features. Things like having a peak ridership below 1,000 people per direction per hour, which basically suggests that the route is either really poorly served or is just a bad route. Or for having low frequency, which is oddly defined as every 15 minutes, which especially for BRT feels really low to me. All of this comes along with the fact that I've definitely seen the credential of true BRT being waved about by advocates of a certain system that might not actually be that great, but opponents of other systems which perhaps don't meet the standards for one reason or another, but are actually good and provide a compelling transit service, can use their lack of meeting the standard as a reason not to fund or not to continue to fund a certain system. Now, sometimes this ends up feeling like gatekeeping BRT, because in real life, as in urbanism and transit, there are always going to be exceptions to the rule. That being said, to be honest, I think setting out a standard is actually really good and quite smart, especially because the ITDP standard actually provides some very useful instructions and ideas and just comments on why each of these points is relevant and issues systems have faced in the past. That being said, a point system just ultimately ends up feeling kind of arbitrary to me, and context is clearly just really important. What might be really easy to implement in one city might be very difficult in another. For example, having super wide strode-like corridors, which is often something we associate with cities that don't have a great urban or walkable environment, are actually probably a lot friendlier to implementing BRT than narrow, more walkable and cyclable streets, because there's simply more room to put dedicated bus lanes and stations. At the same time, the requirement for dedicated lanes, while it totally makes sense at face value, doesn't necessarily always make sense, because there are a lot of streets, and probably more likely highways out there, where congestion basically never exists for structural reasons, and thus buses can operate consistently and reliably at a high speed, and I don't think these systems shouldn't be called BRT because of that. 
The standard from 2016 also somewhat oddly suggests that fare gates are the best option for stations, which feels weird to me. As you probably know, I've made a video talking about systems without fare gates in the past, and I've kind of been won over to the idea that they're not actually the best solution for a lot of systems. And yet the standard kind of implies that they're a good solution mainly for the benefit of operators rather than riders, and I think riders should be at the center of pretty much every decision in public transportation. Of course, that's not saying I don't think the standard is good or a really great thing, because I think both of those. And if I'm honest, I would love one for LRT or trams that could provide similar information on how to design stops, what kind of alignments work best, and common pitfalls. This might even be more valuable than having a BRT standard, because there are a lot of tram and light rail systems out there. That being said, right at the bottom of the ITDP standard, it does acknowledge that a lot of these things can apply to other systems, and so there are some learnings to be found there, which is again why you should check it out down below. And I do have to give them credit for their incredible depth. They even talk about things like pavement quality in the standard. So now that we've talked about BRT, let's talk about different approaches to it that I've seen. I think these can broadly be broken into three different categories. The first is BRT Lite, which is express buses with a good basic level of service, enhanced limited stops, not necessarily with off-board fare payment, but basically always with all-door boarding, which can basically be just as good, and priority measures like queue jumps and dedicated bus lanes in the highest congestion areas. Now again, the standard suggests that you need dedicated bus lanes for the full length of your BRT, but I think BRT light systems often show that this isn't the case. You really only need the dedicated lanes in places where congestion is a real issue. And that kind of gets back to my point about trying to draw a hard line between what does and doesn't qualify as a particular transit mode. There's always going to be exceptions. The next is Transitway, which originated in Ottawa actually, but also exists in places like Toronto and Brisbane. A transitway is usually an entirely separate right-of-way dedicated to buses that operates a bit like a metro crossed with a highway. Basically, you have that dedicated right-of-way which tends to offer high speeds and the like, and you also tend to have large stations which have bypass lanes allowing for express services, as well as lots of bus bays so you can have different routes stopping there. Such systems also tend to have near or total grade separation. The rest of BRT generally runs on some sort of spectrum, between simple systems with roadside stops and dedicated lanes, to more involved and prettied up systems like Viva that still do have grade crossings but have nicer overall infrastructure, to fully grade separated routes that often operate in the center of a road or highway right of way, like the Istanbul Metro bus. With all of that said, I think true BRT is one of those things that gets really overrated. BRT is often talked about as this great success because it's cheap and easy and quick to build, and has been built in a lot of different cities, especially in developing countries and in the United States. And this huge build-out of transit is seen as a big social success, and you can't deny that. More transit, even if it's not optimal, is still great, and that's a positive. As I've said before in this video, a lot of BRT systems provide a really compelling service and have been huge ridership successes. For example, you have the aforementioned Istanbul Metrobus and Guangzhou's BRT, which despite providing very different levels of service, Istanbul is more like a regional BRT while Guangzhou is more like a local BRT. Both of these systems have built up like a million riders worth of ridership a day, which is a ton, even for a metro line. But if you ride these systems, look at the stats, and talk to regular users, you'll find that BRT often has some major user experience, but also structural issues. The first and easily most well-known is BRT creep, which is basically the way that a BRT project can be cut back again and again until it has almost no BRT-like features, either for cost or political reasons. Of course, that's a big part of why the ITDP standard exists, to help prevent that and help call it out when it does happen. But the issue with using buses is it's just easy to cut things back, because at the end of the day, buses can operate on the street. I mean, what are you going to do, run a metro train down the middle of a street? At the same time, a rapid transit system dependent on buses creates other problems. Buses don't last nearly as long as trains and require more expensive, extensive, and frequent maintenance. And in the case that buses are high floor, they still need expensive dedicated stations for boarding. And before you comment, yes, you could technically board a high floor bus using a wheelchair ramp for accessibility reasons and then have stairs for other users, but that's going to be a bad experience and it's probably going to blow up the dwell time, so it's just a bad idea. And no, if you have a high floor bus and you're talking about BRT, have high platforms in 2022. Come on. Another big and sometimes underappreciated issue is the high operating costs of BRT. 
You see, with transit systems, employees of the transit system are often one of the biggest costs, especially related to actually delivering service. And with a metro system, you could have a single employee operating a train that could carry 1,000 or 1,500 passengers at peak loads. You could even have no operator at all, like a lot of modern metro systems. But at best, a BRT system's bus can move 200 or 250 passengers on a single vehicle. And that's not even to mention regular sized buses. Basically, to move the same number of people as a metro, you could easily have four times more drivers. That's a big and unfortunate part of why BRT has been so popular in developing countries, because the wages of drivers are often low and can be kept down. But if a large point of public transportation is improved development and thus higher wages, you're creating a problem because operators have a hard job and they deserve higher wages. But if you need many times as many operators as a metro line, that becomes incredibly expensive to operate. BRT is also difficult to move away from as you develop and gain those higher wages. And as I mentioned, it gets pricier and pricier to operate. Bogota in Colombia, arguably the originator of BRT, is actually building a metro over one of their main BRT corridors. But the city will still have a massive number of BRT services. These will eat up a lot of the public transportation budget and will mean that you can't provide as much service as a more rail-based system could. Of course, I'm not arguing that public transportation budgets should get smaller. I'm just arguing that if you have a system based more on metros, you can provide more additional bus service and more metro service than you would be able to with the BRT system. Now you might imagine that having these big BRT corridors everywhere would make conversion to rail pretty easy, but there haven't been that many BRT conversion projects, and the ones that have happened haven't always gone so great. I also think that if it was so easy to convert such corridors, places like Istanbul and Guangzhou, where again the BRTs are moving like a million people a day, would probably be converting their systems, but they're not. At the same time, BRT systems operate very differently from modern metros, which would probably be the alternative that most people would suggest to them. And what that can lead to is passengers becoming used to a type of public transportation that involves a lot of one-seat rides, which just isn't all that common on a big metro system. There are also the more user experience related complaints that you'll hear, like the fact that so many buses are loud and polluting. And often that's a bigger problem in developing countries where fuel and emission standards might not be as high or might not be as stringently enforced. At the same time, stations aren't necessarily all that small because the multiple berths you need to serve many different buses at once and many different routes as well as perhaps express routes mean that you need a huge structure. And that, along with the fact that right in the standard, it's recommended that BRT stations are set far back from the intersection, something that you wouldn't necessarily see with the metro, but is necessary in order to make sure that buses don't end up blocking the platforms on the station, can mean a lot of walking or rolling to access the transit service. Of course, also, since many of the highest capacity and most used BRTs are fully, if not mostly, grade separated and have vehicles going by every couple of seconds, they can kind of create a bit of a barrier in cities, not unlike a rail corridor, for example. But of course, these are often on the surface and in the middle of major streets, which is kind of the whole point of BRT. Ultimately, I think the main issue I have with BRT is it's often used as a crutch or an excuse to not make the big investments required for higher grades of rapid transit. And when you look at the highest end BRT systems with platform screen doors and those big stations, it's hard to see how they could be that much more affordable than a cost effective elevated metro system that you see getting built all over the place these days. So actually, I think my favorite form of the various types of BRT I've mentioned today is probably BRT Lite, or maybe Transit Way if used in a smaller city. That's because if you can get away with BRT Lite, your city probably isn't that big or that congested. And if it is changing quickly, then BRT Lite is unlikely to lead to the sort of escalation of commitment you see with bigger investments into BRT, where it might feel like, oh, we've already built this BRT route and this BRT route, what's another BRT route going to hurt us? Because you've already built a lot of dedicated stations and right of way and you sort of feel like you have the economies of scale. At the same time, if international development agencies are helping with things like loans for transit and the like, I don't see a reason not to just go straight for metro, especially for fast growing cities. Sure, it might be more expensive upfront, but that's kind of the point of the loans. And if it's less expensive and more reliable to operate in the long term, that's a positive. Now, of course, I like the ITDP and its manual approach, and I think something like it could be incredibly useful for standardizing around other transit modes probably most notably Elevated Metro, which I know I've talked a lot about on this channel, but is seriously very popular in cities building a lot of Metro these days, from Delhi to Bogota to Manila to Jakarta. There's a lot of Elevated Metro out there being built and having standard station designs and the like would be a great way to try to get those costs down. 
The other great thing about funding full metros in places we would have traditionally done BRT is that those systems aren't fundamentally different from what you might see in Hong Kong or even Paris, which literally has elevated metro right in its city center. I just don't always think that the budget-friendly option is the best option. So in closing, I definitely think there are a lot of positive ideas around BRT, and I definitely like the idea of enhanced bus services or providing express buses and enhanced infrastructure. But if you're a big city, you should probably just be building a metro. Thank you.